I've got a little, I got a little treat for everyone in the live audience here. Okay. We have cut together a video from your work yesterday. Would you be interested in seeing what you guys helped create? Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. and, I, and I should say kudos for Nico. Nico uh, was up late last night pulling this together. <laughs> Um, and I think he did it in Final Cut Pro X. So, without further ado, here is the HD SLR Swing Dance. Well done, you guys. Um, I think that's really terrific. Cool. Um, so where do we start? What we're going to uh, do today is to basically um, uh, do a lot more work on lighting. Um, uh, we've got a little set behind us that we're going to demonstrate um, different forms of lighting. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit, and Stephen's going to help me out here and there, about... Um, what the function of lighting is in movies and um, commercials and so on and so forth and how you basically use lighting to um, arc the story. We talked a little bit about this yesterday because um, quite a few questions came in on the, um, uh, from the chat room and things like that that basically took us into that kind of zone. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've worked on movies for 30 plus years and um, I've worked on everything from huge budget um, movies such as the, Ad the first Adams Family um, uh, to mini series like HBO's Earth to the Moon and um, uh, some very very large projects right down to um, the simplest of little things and um, um, basically the same principles apply. It's just a matter of um, expense, time, cost, money, equipment you have at your disposal and, and what you need to do with it. And um, um, I think um, um, one of the things we talked about yesterday that was um, is terribly important is that um, you know lighting in itself is not the most important thing. Um, when you work with a director who in turn is working with writers, um, you should very clearly get direction from the director as to um, the way in which he intends um, for a scene to look. I mean, what's it about? Is it a sad scene? Is it a happy scene? Is it um, a, a dramatic scene? Um, are the things, um, is it an action scene? I mean, every um, single different sort of film, film genre um, um, may require its own kind of cinematography. And, um, uh, and so that needs to be taken into account, obviously, um, because it's very easy to um, uh, take the photography in the wrong direction and um, um, not give the, the script and the director what he deserves in terms of strengthening his story idea. And that, that's really, really important. Um, we talked yesterday about how um, um, certain films um, use a very commercial style of photography that sometimes um, um, beautifies scenes that should perhaps feel a little bit more uncomfortable and um, shouldn't feel so kind of nice and pretty and um, it's all very well shooting everything in uh, late afternoon light and um, uh, you know sort of very early morning light it looks gorgeous but it might not necessarily be the right thing for the scene and you might need things to look more harsh or more um, you know sort of um, basically um, uncomfortable I suppose is the word 
Um, you know, so um, I think uh, with all with all cinematography too, you need to always be thinking outside of the box. I mean, I'll give you um, an example, and um, once again for the um, uh, everybody on the internet, I'm really, really sorry we don't have a lot of material to show because um, all the stuff that I sh shoot and have been shooting for the last few years, and even before that, it all belongs to. Um, uh, you know, NBC, Universal, Fox, um, and it's unbelievably difficult to get permission because you you get into all the um, Writers Guild and the DGA and everybody that wants a percentage. So um, uh, very sadly in this um, workshop, we obviously are gonna make up for it and um, do our very best, but um, I can't show an awful lot of my work and the only way of um, seeing it is to visit my uh, personal website, which I think has been um, that's been blogged on the um, in the chat room, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, take a look at my work, and then you'll get some idea of the kinds of things I've done. Um, but we haven't been allowed to show it here um, just because of all the various technical and legal reasons. So um, um, there's an example of thinking outside the box, just, just moving on. I did the um, HBO miniseries From the Earth to the Moon, which was, uh, you know, probably um, the most important piece of work I've ever done. Okay, it's television, it's not um, a huge movie and all of that, but it was, um, it was a piece of history that, um, to me, was unbelievable and about um, a breed of people that were very, very special. And it was in um, an era when um, special things were done, which we probably will never ever see again in our lifetime. And um, the same thing could be, even though it had a, a more ominous intent, things like the Manhattan Project, um, things like the building of the Panama Canal, <clears throat> um, the whole of the NASA effort to put um, men on the moon was announced by everybody, surprised by, by John Kennedy, um, um, without NASA even knowing that he guaranteed that um, America would put men on the moon within 10 years. And uh, at that point in time, I didn't think uh, anybody had even been in orbit. And um, I think the Russians had just about put um, the Sputnik into orbit, which freaked everybody out completely because we were right in the middle of the Cold War at that point. Um, so I was lucky enough to be uh, chosen to be um, DP on the Earth to the Moon, which was, um, I think, a 12-part miniseries for HBO, um, which was um, inspired by and put together by um, uh, Tom Hanks having done Apollo 13 and um, the group from Imagine, um, uh, Ron Howard and, um, you know, uh, the people that had done um, Apollo 13. Um, Apollo 13, if everyone remembers, was really the story about um, the Apollo mission that went terribly wrong. And uh, for, for days and days and days, it was a huge drama as to whether the three astronauts who were heading towards the moon could be safely brought back without losing their lives. And so it took a massive amount of thinking outside the box and sort of uh, making this work to actually enable them to come back and bring them back into Earth orbit and actually save their lives. And um, Tom, Tom Hanks got to thinking, well, there's a hell of a lot more to this story than um, um, just three guys in a, in a faulty space capsule. There's uh, the whole thing about you know, how wives of astronauts coped with the stress and strain of this, the kind of rigorous training programs that astronauts went through, the, the selection process of astronauts who are sort of amazingly um, special people. I mean, uh, surprisingly enough, um, uh, the major number of astronauts um, uh, came from being Navy pilots because um, landing a, a jet on the deck of an aircraft carrier in a 30-foot swell in the middle of the night when it looks about the size of a postage stamp um, takes an awful lot of guts. And these are people that are uh, so very special and so very unique um, and that can actually um, have the guts to do that. I mean, um, 
almost every astronaut um, has some very unusual property, and that is that under um, cases of extreme duress, when you're actually positive that you're actually going to die, that they can control their heart rate um, uh, to the most amazing degree and don't panic. I mean, most of us would just turn into gibbering wrecks under such situation so they're very very special people and um you know and it's it's a shame that uh, i mean it's kind of rather coincidental that i think yesterday was the last flight of the shuttle mm -hmm. and so for me it's a really sad day to to see that no longer are we going to be putting people in space for the foreseeable future because we don't have an alternative yet and so um, um the science and technology that went into Earth to the Moon was so phenomenal, and to be part of that was one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, um, you know, but um, going into the lighting of it, we had some um, incredible challenges with that. I mean, one of them, first of all, was to light the surface of the moon. Um, and you can't, you know, have a moon set that's sort of 20 feet by 20 meters. I mean, it has to look like a kind of planet right so has to be very very big and um, the one thing we do know about the moon is that it's lit by um, a point light source i.e the sun that's an infinite effectively infinite distance so um, you know the shadow that you see of somebody walking on the, the surface of the moon has to be um, an absolutely sharp and singular shadow um, slight technical hitch with that was that um, there is no such light that was powerful enough um, to light um, the set um, to create that kind of feeling. There were, I mean, the kind of big um, night lighting lights that tend to exist, I mean, even to this present day, are multiple light sources, lights, and you use them to light whole blocks of streets and um, things like that. But if you look very closely, you'll see that. Um, uh, there are multiple shadows and of course if we did that on earth to the moon it would just look ridiculous because it's like saying well there's actually 16 suns all in a cluster somewhere up there you know and um it would have given the game away straight away and of course um there is absolutely no light from the sky it's completely pitch black so there's no fill light whatsoever apart from what is bouncing off the um the uh, the ground on the moon and what's bouncing off another astronaut's suit or what happens to be uh, being reflected off the uh, the lunar module you know so it's an incredibly contrasty situation and somehow we had to um create um that illusion or that feeling um um you know without even having the equipment to do it so we had to effectively reinvent the wheel and create a light to actually do that and I was um, um this is an example of uh, thinking outside the box I was driving down the freeway one day and I um, happened to be behind um, um, a gas tanker one of the, you know how gas tankers have a trailer then on the back of it was a huge um, uh, convex mirror and I could see my car um, sort of all distorted and tiny reflected in the back of it and I thought well, I wonder if that would work. I wonder if we got one of those and we polished it and we we used it as a collector and we put a massive amount of light into it, whether we could use it as a collector to um, then create the feeling of a single light source. So um, we got one of these and it was, I think it was about eight feet in diameter, something like that. And um, we had it polished and then um, the most powerful spotlight at that point in time um, that was commercially available for filmmaking was 10K Xenons that a lot of um, music videos used to use, special, especially Michael Jackson type videos where you wanted huge powerful shafts of light coming in through windows or, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, literally um, ellipsoid focused spots and um, uh, 10K Xenons are absolutely massive. I don't know how many hundreds of pounds they weigh, but they, the, um, the bulb itself is um, at such high pressure that when you go to change the bulb, you have to wear um, a special protective suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, a suit made of Kevlar. And uh, I mean, they're just so scary, these things. And uh, 
Um, I think the, the bulb pressure is something like 600 atmospheres. And, um, uh, you know, when, when they explode, I mean, it's, it blows shards of glass right through the steel housing and uh, all of this stuff. And um, they were the most powerful lights that were available. So we, we um, first of all, our set was about, um, I think it was about 250 by 250 feet. And um, as everybody knows, I mean, if you, if you light a set from very close to it, um, uh, the first point of impact where the light hits the set is going to be way, way brighter than the far part of the set by the inverse square law. Um, the inverse square law to um, anybody scientific, I think it states something like, um, if you double the distance of a light to an object, um, you quarter the amount of light <clears throat> and progressively, so light falls off pretty fast. So in other words, if you have the light, a light right next to a, a, a sort of a 250 by 250 foot set, um, <clears throat> the stop ratio from one side of the set to the other um, is so enormous that it would just look so very, very fake. So the first thing we had to do was to position the light far enough away for the fall off not to be too noticeable so that at least, you know, and I thought that would be about you know, if the brightness was um, a stop and a half brighter on the closest point of the set to the light, and it fell off a stop and a half to the furthest point, it would just about be able to get away with that. But any more than that, it would start to look silly, you know, and unreal. And um, <clears throat> so we started off with, um, you know, one, one xenon, two xenons, three xenons, and the more you add, you know, you just add a quarter of a stop, a quarter of a stop, and a quarter of a stop. And um, at the time, they only had um, 16 10Ks in existence, a company called Xenotech. So we had to have another six of them made for us because we ended up um, needing 22 10K xenons. So we had, um, I don't know, 220,000 watts of light. Um, all going into a single mirror, which was, um, um, there were some really great clues. I mean, we went through all the, the, um, the data from NASA and uh, um, they always timed their landings on the moon um, so that the sun was exactly at eight degrees um, off the horizon um, because that gave them maximum um, perception of um, the texture of the lunar surface so that, you know, if, if the light was directly coming down flat from above the capsule, it was very likely that they would put a foot of the lunar module down on a boulder or in a hole without even knowing it. And so the more raking the light across the lunar texture, the more you know, Neil Armstrong on his first attempt would be able to safely put the spacecraft down without the whole thing tipping over, because if it had tipped over, that would have been the, been the end of that mission. And um, um, so um, that gave us a clue. So we positioned our mirror that um, hit the center of the set at about eight degrees, which meant that um, that was about 250 feet away from the set. And you, you know, you're talking a two, 250-foot set, the light's 250 feet, that's a 500-foot long set already. We actually happen to be uh, shooting in a incredible building in Tustin in Orange County in California, where um, luckily these, uh, this amazing building exists where they used to keep um, uh, Navy blimps um, uh, during the Second World War, big, dirigible airships, um, zeppelins, whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> and um, they used to be able to park two of these in this building. And so luckily this building was 1,250 feet long, about 300 feet wide without a single. And it was almost like um, it was constructed out of wood. So it would just shimmy during an earthquake in California. And it was really constructed like um, an enormous boat, just upside down, you know, that kind of rib structure. And um, the issue was that it had a lot of skylights in it, so um, <clears throat> just the expense of covering the skylights meant immediately we had to shoot everything at night um, because it would have cost we just incalculable amounts of money to black out all the skylights. We already had used um, five miles of duvetine, which is black fabric, um, 60 feet tall, 
uh, to go right the way around the uh, the building. I mean, it was just huge. And then we had our 22 K xenons that all were focused into this mirror. And um, then we started getting paranoid about the amount of heat from these lights because when we started doing tests on the lights, um, um, you know, uh, in an electrical crew, you have a gaffer, you have a best boy. And when my best boy was sort of helping us position something, there was a moment when he walked in front of one of the xenons and his hair started smoking. Oh. And um, that's how powerful these lights are. And um, we had 22 of them and the amount of just the kind of static electricity around the ballast of these lights was just so intense. And uh, they were all in, in a room and um, um, all focused up into this um, mirror. Um, first thing that happened was that within about 10 minutes, the heat on the mirror um, caused the aluminum to oxidize. Um, so immediately we were lo losing stop. So we had to pull it all down. We had to repolish it. We had to coat it. And then uh, the next thing that we started noticing was that um, uh, the um, edges started distorting slightly with the heat. So then we realized that we had to then water cool it. <clears throat> so then we brought it all down again and we um, put a shell on the back of it with fins inside and then it, an inlet and outlet pipe and ran cold, cold water through it to keep it cool. And then we got it back up again and, um, you know, Producers start to run out of patience at a certain point, um, <laughs> and especially when um, uh, everything you're doing um, relies on your plan to work. Because in this case, there wasn't there wasn't a B plan. Because they kept saying, "Well, what's the B plan?" And I said, "Well, you know, the B plan is this: um, Tustin happens to be." closer to the Mexican border than Los Angeles. So I said, that's my B plan is to take a bus to Mexico because um, I don't really have another solution to this. We have to make, um, sure. I was just gonna ask, how many days did it take you to figure all this out? Because it sounds like a huge process. Um, it was a huge project. We, we um, most of Earth to the Moon was shot in studios in Florida actually. Um, so we started doing tests and started to try and calculate how many lights we need. But um, we had about, um, I think, about a month wow. um, at the Tustin um, hangar to, uh, to pull all this together. Um, you know, it just went on and on and on. And uh, um, in the end, it actually looked um, really, really beautiful. But that was just the beginning of our problems because um, when you actually look at an astronaut's helmet, they're sort of gold-plated on the outside to protect them from whatever it is, the, the, the direct UV that um, comes from the sun. And, um, you know, they're sort of gold-plated, so you're looking at a goldfish bowl mirror. <laughs> and um, so where do you put the camera? It's like, uh, well, that's a bit of a problem. Um, because when you, you know, and the first um, hint I got of this was when I went to the... Um, you know, the NASA Museum down at um, uh, Cape Kennedy. And um, Jim Lovell's suit is there. And um, I suddenly realized when I was looking into the helmet that you could not only see, um, you know, it's a complete sort of um, um, space suit with a helmet mm, as if there's a person inside it standing in a, in a sort of enclosure. And uh, you can see um, the guy's boots. So it not only reflects down there, but you can also see directly above and slightly behind on all sides, which means that um, there's almost nowhere to put the camera because um, you know what you expect to see in an astronaut's helmet when you're looking at them and they're on the surface of the moon is possibly another astronaut, possibly the lunar module, but certainly the lunar surface with a very, very clean horizon that is black and absolutely pitch black above. And, and then sort of, um, you know, sort of mid to light gray below, which is the, the lunar uh, Earth. And um, so every single shot virtually had to be done by putting um, a remotely operated camera crane on top of another camera crane called a, a Titan so that we could reach in from 70 feet away. 
and uh, bring the camera in from slightly above and black everything out so that the the blackness of the blacked out camera would disappear into the blackness of the space that we created and use zoom lenses and um, you could never ever have a camera sort of within 60 feet of an astronaut and not see that um, there was something that was interfering with the lunar surface or breaking the horizon line. The only time we could ever do that was when we could hide the camera in the lunar module structure and, you know. And then we came upon the real problem. <laughs> and the real problem was that um, astronauts on the moon, they only have one sixth of their body weight because the moon being much smaller only has one sixth of Earth gravity, so um, people move in a very, very different way. So you can't have people just wandering around, it would have looked ridiculous. And um, so we had this initially this grand plan to um, uh, use kind of rigging above and put them on harnesses and fly them around. And, and of course, as soon as we saw the helmets, we the, the visors. Um, we realized that all that stuff being metal would have reflected. It would just be immediately in reflection. So I, I said, well, why don't we put them on helium balloons? And, uh, and luckily this building, I think it's so tall that it's, uh, I think it's almost 200 feet tall in the center. I mean, it's just massive and uh, it's probably about 10 forests in one hit. And uh, but anyway, um, so we thought, well, that could be cool because um, on their backpacks, they actually had an antenna that um, um, it looks like a steel wire. So if we could cable to that point, uh, then in post, we could just cut it off and pretend it was just the antenna. So we, um, um, for most of the shots, I mean, the, the suits were so heavy um, in Earth gravity that we had to use stuntmen because it was agonizing to be inside these suits for more than sort of 15 minutes because you know, we had to have cooling systems to keep them from dying of heat exhaustion, just the sheer weight of the suits, and all of those sorts of things led to it being unbelievably difficult. This was at the point where I realized that all those um, idiotic rumors we've heard about um, <laughs> how it was all faked up and everything, I realized were completely untrue because <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> nobody could do this, and, um, um, and especially not 30 years yeah. ago, uh -huh. you know, um, because the technology didn't exist to be able to fake it up 30 years ago, and uh, it was hard enough for us. And, uh, so anyway, so we, we realized that we needed these massive black helium balloons that would, you know, um, have to be at least 50 feet above them to um, not reflect and would disappear into the darkness and be out of the field of light and so on and so forth. And uh, the only trouble was that they were so huge, they were about sort of 30 feet in diameter. And when the astronauts came to come together, of course, the balloons <laughs> wouldn't allow them to come together. Yep. Uh, so, Oh dear, you know, and it was just a lack of imagination that, and we ended up with balloons that were 12 feet in diameter, but 70 feet tall, um, you know, made out of black fabric, and um, that way they could at least um, come together and not be sort of pushed apart by the pressure of the balloons. Um, you know, so um, that was how, what we had to do, um, um, you know, thinking outside of the box and solving problems that had never ever been um, uh, encompassed before or encountered before rather, um, you know, to get around all the various problems one by one. It was just, um, you know, luckily we had um, visionary producers and um, because um, of Tom Hanks and um, Ron Howard and um, all the guys from Imagine, um, you know, HBO, they they realized that this had to look real and it had to be, you know, we, we this was something that was going to be a series that had to be, um, you know, basically absolutely accurate, absolutely uh, historically accurate, and it couldn't be something that looked fake in any way. It had to be achieved, and um, because um, as time will tell, I think it'll become one of those um, 
uh, television programs that will be seen by schools and seen by um, kids in future generations as being the ultimate sort of documentary of everything that needed to go through um, <clears throat> to put people on the moon, basically. And um, you know, so that was just an example of our tiny side of it and compared to what NASA had to go through to um, achieve all of their things to put men on the moon. Of course, our side was absolutely nothing, but, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of very, very brave people died in that. Um, I, can't, I think it was Apollo, I can't remember which Apollo number it was, where the astronauts um, were asphyxiated in a test, and it was just in a simple test, and um, the reason was, was because they, um, they ran the, uh, the test with a pressurized um, capsule, but it was pressurized with pure oxygen. And what nobody knew was that um, Velcro, which astronauts fell in love with, because everything floated around, they could stick things wherever they needed to, and they'd be there when they went to look for them instead of floating off. Um, nobody had ever done a test on Velcro in pressurized 100% oxygen and discovered that it was incredibly inflammable. And, um, you know, normally you can stick a lighter or stick it over a flame and it, nothing happens to it, but just under those, that one circumstance of pressurized oxygen, Velcro became unbelievably inflammable. And that's what, you know, just a little short circuit in a wire and suddenly poof, the whole thing was um, on fire and very sadly, the design of the capsule was such that you had to open the door inward and because of the pressure of the, uh, you know, the expanding air in an oxygen-driven fire, the pressure was way too great for the astronauts to be able to open the door and, um, and escape, so they were all um, asphyxiated. And um, it was things like that that were kind of inspirational in trying to do a great job and, you know, and try and... Um, you know, at least do my part in living up to um, the dream of all of these amazing people that had, uh, um, you know, been part of that project that had cost billions and billions of dollars. And sadly, you know, I don't think we'll ever see projects like that again. So uh, that was one of the biggest projects, probably the biggest project I've ever worked on. And um, like that. Um, uh, so it was kind of, uh, you know, it's a great series and I think it's, it'll stand up for a long, long time in schools and things like that as being uh, historically very accurate. And, um, um, and we got to meet, I was lucky enough to meet uh, um, a lot of the astronauts. Dave Scott, who was on, walked on the moon on Apollo 15, was a um, technical advisor, absolutely wonderful man. I mean, these, these are super people, I mean, super special people, and um, that was a great experience, and, um, you know, so that's, um, uh, but just going back to um, how you um, solve problems, I mean, that was one example. I mean, on top of solving problems, there's often um, in lighting, when I was talking about thinking outside the box, um, there's often lots of subliminal messages that you can put in there. And there was a particular scene, which again, sadly, I can't show you, um, um, where I, um, I really did feel like um, astronauts were kind of um, the nearest that the human race had got to becoming gods or angels or whatever you would want to say. I mean, they're, because they're so special people. And I was sort of trying to think of a way to kind of make them um, in the in the um, series kind of have that feeling. And so um, um, there was a scene we did in a dressing room where they, or a kit room, it's where they got kitted up into all their, um, <clears throat> you know, their outfits and, you know, everything obviously is locked and airtight and so on and so forth. And um, um, before they put on all their extra telecommunications gear, their, their helmets are almost effectively just like a plexi goldfish bowl. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be really cool to kind of get a reflection of a halo um, in the helmet? Because um, nobody will notice it, but I believe that um, if you um, put things into the subconscious or you put things into images, 
um, they enter the subconscious of the viewing audience and um, so it could be just a shadow on a wall that's rather spooky or it could be um, the shape of something that um, forebodes um, a threat or something a bit scary. In this case, um, in order to do that, I asked our art department to build a massive um, a ring light on the ceiling, um, which was about 30 feet in diameter. Um, just a big soft um, circular light on the, you know, um, those fluorescents that are kind of circular, but like a massive version of that, but it was built um, onto the ceiling. And um, um, so by positioning the um, uh, one of the actors in a certain position, it made an absolutely circular, slightly distorted because of the plexi um, reflection on his helmet and effectively put a halo on his head. And, um, and probably nobody would ever notice it, but if you, if you look for things like that, and you think about things like that, and you, when you go through a script, you, you think about um, those sorts of subliminal messages. I think it's when uh, you can really do very interesting things in photography, and that's part of what um, studying the script. And, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a, uh, you know, a huge epic. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a little, tiny, low-budget film. The opportunities for that kind of thinking always exist.